Okay. But I did have an envelope in there that with my stuff that I an envelope from somebody. Uh, I saw financial stuff. Mail oh. stuff. I was looking for briefings, so I wasn't really paying attention. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure that I get that envelope because I've got to respond to it. Ready? Okay, are we ready? <laughs> Let's go. There we go. Okay, good morning, Council. I'm calling the case of Tobin versus Stokes, case number A one nine seven nine nine eight nine zero dash C. Would you announce your appearances for the record? And let's go ahead and start with Plaintiff's Counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. John Thompson, uh, appearing for the Plaintiff Nona, Nona Tobin. My number is 5802. Okay. Ms. Stokes, Counsel? Yes, good morning, Your Honor. Joseph Palm for uh, Stokes. Give me that trust. Okay. And then it looks like we have Nation Star and Red Rock Financial Services. Good morning, Donna Wittig on behalf of Red, um, Nation Star Mortgage. Red Rock? Is Red Rock Councils on? Well, it's Red Rock Financial Services motion to dismiss. I was just wondering who's going to be arguing that. I don't think we had any. So, Your Honor, this is Joseph Palm. Your Honor, this is Joseph Palm for the uh, Stokes. The Red Rock Council has been contacted with you because they're having some uh, technical difficulties, it seems like. Okay. We haven't been, uh, we haven't uh, received that message. Um, they, they said they emailed your law for Boston. So the reason they called me saying, hey, are we still going forward? And I said, yes, we're just on hold because the judge uh, used every case until their case is called. So I'm not understanding why they're not on the line. They, they should be, but uh, I'll email them right now. But they just called me on like 30 minutes, so. Okay. Are you, this is Brody White with Red Rock. Are you waiting oh, for me? Oh, you got yeah. on. Okay, cool. I did get on. I got I got, I got on some wrong meeting for some for a minute. I don't know what happened, but now I'm off. Okay, well, it's your motion to dismiss. Uh, we, so, also, we also have Brittany Wood for Quicken Loans. Oh, okay, we got Brittany Wood uh, for uh, Quicken Loans, right? As well as Brian and Deborah Tessie, Your Honor. Okay, could you spell that name, please? It's misspelled in the caption, but it's correctly spelled C H I E S I. Okay. Very good. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and hear from you, Mr. White. All right. Uh, and for the record, again, this is Brody White on behalf of Red Rock Financial Services. Uh, I don't have much to say, Your Honor. I think uh, our motion is pretty self-explanatory. You know, this is. Uh, in, in effect, this is just an attempt at gamesmanship. This is Nina Tobin's attempt to retry her case once again. I mean, it's it's clearly that on the face. He went through the an entire uh, case, motion for summary judgment that she lost, a trial that she lost. That whole case was about whether or not a Red Rock, uh, Red Rock wrongfully foreclosed on the property or improperly foreclosed on the property. And the court in the previous case held that Red Rock didn't do it. So now this is just her turning around and uh, filing it again. And in her opposition, she made it clear that she's simply relying on the false premise that claim preclusion doesn't apply here because the trust was the party beforehand. We are the party net, or that Nina Tobin is the party now as an individual. But as the court read, that. That argument doesn't apply because claim preclusion doesn't just apply to the exact parties. It applies to parties in the privities. So Nina Tobin as a trustee for the trust and Nina Tobin as an individual are in privity with each other. They can't, they can't just switch hats and bring and go through this whole process over again. Uh, it doesn't allow it. The doctrine of claim preclusion doesn't allow it. And with that, we'd rest on that. Okay. Unless you're on, I have some questions. Any questions? Nope, and there's uh, folks that um, 
joined in this motion. Does anybody would like to speak before I talk with the uh, plaintiff's attorney? No? Okay. I'd like to speak with plaintiff's attorney then. Mr. Thompson. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm sorry. I missed that. No. Okay, Mr. Hall? Yeah, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Did, did the court take something? I, I missed that. About I just said anybody, I said there's a bunch of joinders in that motion. Does anybody want to speak in support of that motion? Oh, yes, Your Honor. I will. Joseph Hall for the fellow parties. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the counsel for uh, Red Rock State is correct. The, the team here and the opposition from plaintiffs makes very clear the singular argument really is that Ms. Tobin was not, individually, was not a party to the previous litigation before Judge Kitchener. Well, that's fine and dandy. That, that's okay. We will not dispute that, but as the court is aware, Res judicata absolutely applies to those in privity. And she is absolutely in privity with the trust. There's just no doubt, even if we, everything she says is true, where the trust allegedly conveyed the property to her via quick claim, claim, quick claim deed, whatever, even if that's all taken is true, that's fine. She's in privity and she can't get away from res judicata. There's just no way around that, Your Honor. And this is, for my client, this is, the second or I think the third time this is happening now with Ms. Tobin and pursuant to my client's counter motion under EDCR 7.601 uh, D1 and or 3, uh, we respectfully request reimbursement of attorney's fees and costs in the amount of $3,165, Your Honor. There's just no basis whatsoever for this complaint that has been filed. And again, uh, EDCR 7.60 is a different standard than Rule 11. We don't have to send a uh, safe harbor letter or whatnot. It's as long as the other side has an opportunity to be heard, which they have. And by the way, uh, she did not at all oppose the counter motion. She was silent as to that. So respectfully, uh, Red Rock's motion to dismiss that my client joined in must be granted because this is absolutely res judicata. And we request the reimbursement of my client's fees and costs related to this complaint. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Anybody else that's joined in the motion like to speak? Your Honor, I would just add, this is for you, on behalf of the Chessies and their lender, Quick and Loans. Um, I just add one thing, Your Honor. In the Harris case, it was a little more complicated as to whether or not there was privity there because you were dealing with a negligence case. In a property case, privity is not a difficult concept. Uh, Nana Tobin, in her capacity as a trustee, signs a quick claim deed, transferring the property to um, herself as an individual. And in real property, that's textbook example of privity. Um, and I would also add that the type of deed that she chose to transfer the property is telling as well. There are no statutory warranties that accompany a quick claim deed. It's simply a matter of any, any interest that the trust had would be transferred to Tobin as an individual. And the court already determined that the trust had no interest in the property. So she's bound by that, um, both by claim preclusion, issue preclusion, and the type of deed itself that transfers, um, that purports to transfer the property because there was nothing to transfer, Your Honor. Um, and the, the Chessies have also filed a request for their attorney's fees as well, Your Honor. And how much is that? Um, it, it's closer to $7,500, Your Honor, and the reason for that, my clients were not involved in the underlying litigation, so there was quite a bit of review that went into looking what happened in the prior litigation before filing our motion. Okay. And we also did prepare the request for judicial notice as part of our motion, Your Honor. Okay. And let's talk with Mr. Thompson. Good morning, Your Honor. John Thompson. Um, 
We can't paint this motion in broad strokes as they've done. Uh, there are details that matter here. Uh, first of all, issue and claim preclusion, uh, they don't apply if the par party hasn't had a full and fair opportunity to litigate. That's in the Thompson case that I've cited. Ms. Tobin thought she was a party. Uh, the other parties thought she was a party and they treated her like a party. They filed documents and even a motion was heard on April 7, 2017. Uh, the HOA filed a motion to dismiss Tobin as an individual, which was denied. Uh, two years later, it was finally put in an order on the eve of trial on 9-20-2019. So we have this situation where um, everyone thinks she's a party. They think her rights are being litigated. It is true that the trust transferred its interest in the property to uh, Nona Tobin on March 28, 2017, and that none of the parties brought her in as an individual. Now, whether they thought she was, I think that was correct. I think they thought she was. But then, at the eve of trial, she's put out of the litigation, and, and now you can't say that she had a full and fair opportunity to litigate. Her rights have never been adjudicated. The appellate court said that, that she was not a part of the underlying litigation, and so you have a catch-22. Oh, we don't have to hear her arguments. Uh, they're all rogue documents. She, she filed these motions for summary judgment as an individual. Um, she filed these motions for your trial. All of these things don't have to be heard because she's not a party. And then when she brings an action to enforce those very same rights against different parties, Red Rock, for example, was not a party in the prior suit. Joel Stokes was not a party. Uh, the Kessies were not a party. Quicken Loans were, was not a party. So this transfer from the trust to her as an individual has never been adjudicated. And it goes directly um, to the First Amendment complaint that's been filed here. Can't say on the one hand, um, she's not a party, we're not going to listen to her, we're not going to argue, we're not even going to name her as a party, even though the whole world was on notice on March 28, 2017, when she received... Um, this uh, interest from the trust as an individual, no one thought to bring her in or to verify so that it would be raised judicata, so it would be claim preclusion. Um, in addition, there's a very substantial issue. In 2014, when this sale took place, there's a substantial amount of money, tens of thousands, $60,000, I believe, that were excess proceeds. Now, the statute is very clear that those excess proceeds should go, A, either to the trust, if they think that the trust is the proper party, or if Red Rock thinks that Nona Tobin is because of the March 28, 2017 detransfer from the trust, and the excess proceeds go there. There was even representation, Your Honor, that the, the funds had been interplayed. And to this day, we still don't have those funds, nor do we know where they are. Now, in the briefing, it says, the uh, Red Rocks camp, uh, party says that, oh, uh, the proper place is to interplay. Well, it's been five years, okay? That's not proper. And so just on that issue alone, um, you know, the, the money was not transferred, and we believe that, that was wrongfully done, not done. That omission makes this amended uh, complaint also valid. So different parties, no full and fair opportunity to litigate as an individual in the prior suit, um, and different facts. There's different uh, things that happened. This March 28th deed was never addressed in the other case. She tried to do it. So, Your Honor, we're to enforce her rights. That's why we filed this complaint. And, um, and, and here we are. Okay. Uh, Mr. White? Yeah, I mean, we just need to go over a little bit how wrong that was in, in reference to like what happened in the last case. I, I mean, Mr. Thompson talked as though, you know, Tobin just never had a team. Like, there was this transfer of the property that occurred on March 28th, 
And poor Nina Tobin was never able to try her claims. And that's not what happened. What happened was that Tobin brought her claims as a trustee. She went through an entire trial where she asserted that the trust owned the property. She was the party there. She was the, she was the one behind the wheel arguing. And it wasn't until she lost a summary judgment, it wasn't until she lost a trial, it wasn't until her attorney um, withdrew from the case, at least had an oral uh, motion to withdraw granted, that she turned around and said, oh, guess what? It wasn't the trust owned property. Uh, it was me individually. There was a transfer of the deed in March, which, by the way, that could not occur because she had no deed on the trust. So the property had been foreclosed on. That occurred in March 28th, during the middle of all this litigation. And so now we have to turn around and redo all of this. And that she does not have the opportunity to do that. Um, she, Mr. Thompson argued that she didn't have her day in court because, you know, we didn't allow her in that last trial. But that's not anybody's fault but hers. She wasn't involved in that other action because she chose not to intervene. She chose to pursue her claims as the trustee, not as herself individually. That was her choice. And when she chose to go through the trial as the trustee, not as an individual, she is now precluded under claim preclusion, under judicial estoppel, under a number of doctrines, from now turning around and saying, oh, no, it wasn't that. It was me individually. Let's do this all again. She can't do that. She can't have two days in court. She can't bring Red Rock or the HOA to court twice to retry these cases and, and, and see if the foreclosure was improper or not, because a court has already held it was proper after summary judgment at the trial. Um, in regards to the excess proceeds, Your Honor, the only reason Red Rock has not interpled those excess proceeds is because Ms. Tobin keeps challenging the foreclosure sale. And Red Rock is not going to interplead any excess funds if there's a chance the foreclosure sale can be overturned. So when Mr. Thompson says, oh, it's been five years and the, and the proceeds have not been interplayed, it's been five years because Ms. Tobin keeps challenging the process. As soon as, as soon as we have final word that the process was proper, Red Rock will interplead those funds. Red Rock claims no interest in those funds. Um, it wants to get those funds off its hands as soon as possible, but it needs to do it in a legally permissible way. Um, and that, that way is not through an unjust enrichment claim against Red Rock, because there are other parties that may have an interest in all or a portion of those proceeds. Now we need to, we need to, um, divest ourselves of those proceeds in the proper manner, which is an interpleader action. And with that, I rest. Okay, uh, Mr. Hong, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I would. <laughs> Again, I, I, I apologize for everyone for being repetitive, but uh, I, I laugh a little bit too. Again, there's no perfect of a case that represents res judicata than this case, Your Honor. Uh, in terms of counsel for Ms. Holden and arguing uh, not to get a fair day in court, I, I just I don't even understand that argument because there was summary judgment in favor of the HOA and then my client went through a full-blown trial with the trust. And the core issue, as stated in our moving papers, Ms. Tobin cannot get any relief from my client nor the current owners nor Quicken Loans unless the HOA sale is void. That's the only way that can happen. And she can only void the sale by saying the same argument that were raised in front of Judge Kishner at the time of the summary judgment and the trial, by the way, which are both being appealed by the trust as we see. So that case is on appeal, and yet Ms. Tobin filed this frivolous secondary action identical, and counsel before Ms. Tobin say something about an interpreter, I just looked up the amended complaint, Your Honor. There's not one iota reference of interpreting funds. So this whole thing about, well, she should get funds, well, well great. It's not even pled. It's not even pled in the amended complaint. So this whole argument trying to sidestep the issue is just not going to work. Your Honor, again, 
uh, respectfully, my client absolutely is entitled to attorney's fees and costs related to this third attempt now to adjudicate the very same issues that were adjudicated in front of Judge Kistner, and it's three thousand one hundred sixty. Five dollars pursuant to my declaration that was attached that outlined the hours uh, actually expended and the anticipated, which is this hearing today. Okay, uh, Miss Wood. Uh, just briefly, Your Honor, uh, there has been no explanation as to how Ms. Tobin is not in privity with the trust. It's defined in the Harris case as this. To be in privity, the person must have acquired an interest in the subject matter affected by the judgment through one of the parties as by inheritance, succession, or purchase. And the Harris case also cites the restatement second of judgments, section 41, subsection 1, which specifically states that a beneficiary of the trust, which Ms. Tobin is, is bound by a judgment in which the trustee participated in the action. Ms. Tobin participated in the prior action as a trustee of the trust, and as a beneficiary of the trust, she is bound by that judgment. Um, there's just been no explanation as to how that's not met in this case, Your Honor. Uh, this, the second thing that I would point out, and we brought this up in our reply brief, Your Honor, is think about what they're asking this court to do in this case. I don't know how many uh, quiet title cases you have involving NRS Chapter 116 foreclosures, but I know that the district court was inundated with them. And what they're asking this court to do is to allow parties who participated in that litigation, whether it went to summary judgment or trial, to just quit claiming their interest to some other entity or if they had an entity to themselves for no consideration and then to retry the entire case. Can you imagine what that would do to the courts if that were allowed? Um, that is what claim preclusion and issue preclusion uh, don't allow. There's a public policy reason for that, Your Honor. Um, and then the, the last thing that I would address, my clients have no interest uh, in the excess funds, but I would just suggest that the suggestion that Ms. Tobin has a claim to those um, is unrealistic because at the time the property was sold, there's no question Ms. Tobin's own testimony said uh, at trial, again, she testified at trial, confirmed that she was in default not just on one loan but on two loans at the time. So any excess proceeds would go to those lenders uh, not okay. All right, counsel, I've reviewed everything, and I, I even scrolled through the prior case. By the way, it would be very helpful to have full captions on these uh, so it could so we can follow the parties, but in any event, uh, Judge Kishner apparently didn't require that. I do in my court. But in any event, uh, Mr. Thompson, it appears to me that Ms. Tobin is looking for a do-over, and she had her opportunity um, as the trustee, she also, uh, it looks like, participated individually in the prior case as well, and uh, it went to trial. It was a four-year case. It's on appeal now. So I think she, uh, her, uh, she needs to conclude whatever she needs to do in that other case, but I think she's had her day in court. So I am granting Red Rock Financial Services motion to dismiss. And I will look at the uh, issues relating to the attorney's fees. I'm going to do that under advisement, okay? Um, so, um, Mr. White, will you go ahead and prepare the um, order? Yeah, I'll prepare the order and circulate it. All right. That'd be perfect. And I'd like you all to review it to make sure that you approve it as to form and content. Not that you necessarily agree with me, Mr. Thompson, but that you at least agree that that was what happened at the court um, hearing. All right? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, let's go ahead and call that other one. And uh, could you, um, oh, I've got to do this one. This Boyd Nelson. What's this one? This is the Oh, you know, it's not got to hurry on it, too. Okay, well, let's go ahead and do uh, the state versus Boyd Nelson. Oh, Boyd Nelson. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. I wrote Jeff Masuda. He's Jess Masuda.